Hey, 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 everybody. Great, great, great to see all y'all out there in Son of Sam land. Uh, hey, uh, we got a great one for you today. Yes, this was something that I conceived on my afternoon walk with Maxie. And, um, well, it was uh, one that I thought actually was quite important because as we come up on Halloween, well, we want to talk about these spooky subjects. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. It's actually Sam Hain we're coming up on. It's not Halloween. Oh, I, I, I mispronounced it. It's actually Sawain. You know, these cultists, they're like the stupidest people on earth. They're like church ladies. Um, hold on. Hold on one second. Someone say something about the audio. Check one, check one. Should be okay. Yeah. Anyway, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna assume it's on Dave's end. So yeah, there are these people are like church leaders. It's like if you don't pronounce Sa, 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 Wa, Sam Hain Sa Wayne, like all of a sudden they they're like uh, all angry at you and so on and so forth. All right, so we're getting a couple things here with echo sounds. Give me a second here. Let me, uh, let me listen and see what's going on. Okay, give me a sec. I think I know what's going on. Check one, check one. How's that? Is that better? Is that better, guys? Just give me a little a little bump in the... Uh, I hate when these technical things happen, you know, because it's like kills the flow of the show. All right, cool. So it says it's better. Good. Yeah. So, yeah. So these people are like church ladies. It's like if you don't pronounce Sam, Hain, Sa, Wayne, all of a sudden you're like uh, excommunicated from whatever weird Dungeons and Dragons world they live in. And it's like it's spelled Sam Hain. It's got S-A-M-H-A-I-N. I mean, uh, why would I even think to pronounce it Sa Wayne when it's Sam Hain? Anyway, so <laughs> we got we got a good one for you today. Um, I actually thought this was uh, actually a very important one to do, despite my uh, <laughs> rather um, choppy intro and beginning to today's show and technically uh, imperfect. Because, well, Untermeyer Park is a subject that if you think about it, whether you're on the side of the cult theory of Son of Sam or whether you're on the side of uh, what that I am, with, that there was absolutely no cult involvement in Son of Sam whatsoever, we still have this issue of cultists and Satanists in Untermeyer Park. It, it still exists. It's a sociological phenomenon that actually happened in the real world that existed. And it's something that, uh, well, we need to discuss further. We need to come together as a community and figure out just what the hell was going on in Untermeyer Park. And we're talking about for decades here. We're talking about from the 1950s to at least the 1990s. So it's like we can come together on this subject and hopefully find out some answers. And of course, if you're one of these people who says it was the process that was in Untermeyer Park with Ken from Australia be being uh, illustrated by Billy the Artist while Moloch and Rumpelstiltskin were Circle jo Jack in the Pipe Band um, having picnics, <laughs> I mean prove it. You have to prove it, right? Because we've already done one thing that's very important. And that's what this show is going to be today is going to be a kind of a clearinghouse of, of the of the full information about occultists in Untermeyer Park. We have proven for the first time in true crime history on this channel that yes, indeed, there was occultic activity in, in, in Untermeyer Park. It wasn't just an urban legend. We're going to see the, the oral testimonies today of four separate witnesses, some of whom I think saw the same exact group of people because it's around the same time. And we'll get into that and, and all that. But um, in either case, uh, so we've put on record that this stuff actually existed. It's no longer an urban legend. OK. And, and Yonkers is replete, filled with stories about people who were, were warning their kids not to go into Untermeyer Park in the 1960s, 1970s and so on and so forth. So that ship has sailed. There were there were occultists in Untermeyer Park. The question is, of course, who were they? And we're not going to come up to any answers today because we can't. 
um, I've never taken the extra step to find out who who these people were. I mean, they're 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 shadowy. No one they, they never identified themselves. It's not like they were signing a guest book when they came to the gatehouse and started killing t tortoises and calves and certainly German shepherds. But at the same time, there's absolutely no proof that Ken from Australia was there from the process, that Robert de Grimston was there, even that David Berkowitz was there. There's absolutely zero evidence in the public domain that points to it. So this is a, an area ripe for research in the Son of Sam community. If you are if you are on the side of the cult theorists and Son of Sam, well, you have to do one certain thing. You have to prove your point. You have to prove it using your own firsthand primary evidence. You have you can't use the words of Maury Terry, a known liar, a person whose book that I've actually debunked a million times. You can't use those words back to me. You're going to have to go up to Yonkers. You're going to have to pound the pavement like we did, and you're going to have to find out who these people were. That's going to be the only way that we're ever going to resolve this. So that's my challenge to all of you guys out there in the cult world. Go find Ken from Australia and see if he was uh, leading Berkowitz's hand while Billy the Artist was sketching him, while Moloch was Circle Jack and Rumpelstiltskin, while the Riverdalians were having picnics. I mean, come on, guys. This is ridiculous. But anyway, we got a lot to do today, so I want to, uh, I want to get right to it. So today's going to be kind of a retrospective. We're going to look at some really special moments for me and maybe for you, those of you who've been with me a long time. Well, we're going on three years now, and uh, some of the stuff we're going to see today goes back to the earliest of the early days. And so we're going to uh, see the oral testimonies. I basically have distilled four different videos into one and given you the greatest hits. And so think of this video today as like sort of like the beginning of this quest. What the hell was going on in Untermeyer Park? All of these videos have been in the public domain for years now, but uh, I think it's a good uh, good thing, especially for new viewers, to have one video, today's live stream, where we have all of the Untermeyer Park stuff in one nice, compact, neat pass, uh, uh, package. F so then hopefully we can start this conversation of, again, just what the hell was going on in Untermeyer Park. So before we get into... Uh, the meat of the matter, the video today. I, I prepared a little slideshow for you that, um, well, raises a few questions, sort of intros the topic. And of course, the thumbnail today shows our four protagonists. We have Tommy over here, Tommy Welker, who was, uh, we'll see his oral testimony today. Of course, the very famous and very special Burn who we loved so much in the original video series. I'm sure all of you old school heads of the video series remember Burn fondly. We're going to see her testimony today. Of course, Craig Fitzgerald, the controversial Yonkersonian, who himself had a story that was recounted to him of the of Satanists in Untermeyer Park. And of course, the piece de resistance, Mr. E himself. The guy who was in the Unsolved Mysteries with Robert Stack, Son of Sam edition. He was the guy who led Maury Terry around the park in 1986, showed him the Devil's Cave and all that kind of stuff, told him about the satanic activity. This dude is perhaps the biggest eyewitness of occultic activity to take pl that, that ever took place in, uh, in, in Yonkers. So let me just look at the chat real quick, make sure... All right, everybody. Great to see you out there, out there. All right, good. All right. So now when I first started in Son of Sam, there was a lot of people who were like, who's this newbie? This guy wasn't a known entity in Son of Sam. We don't know him. He wasn't a member of any of the Facebook groups. He wasn't sitting there talking about Billy the Artist and Moloch and uh, which which person was uh, Don, uh, Mr. Real Estate and all that. Um, yeah, all that's true. I wasn't doing that. I wasn't a dweeb on Facebook having, <laughs> having circular jerking arguments that can never be proven. I was actually interested in this case from a, from a screenwriter's point of view. I was, uh, of course, a big time Terry head. And this is, uh, this is 1996 in the famous, uh, well, basically where we are here in this thumbnail, the same pillars that we see here in the year 2022 when I took that picture. This is 1996, much different uh, look. And there's your 
trusty reporter right there with my MC jacket and uh, much shorter hair, of course. And uh, so I go back to Untermeyer Park to the 80s, actually. The first time I was ever in Untermeyer Park was 1988 with a friend of mine. Uh, our, his mother drove us up there. I had no idea what it was. It was just this fascinating, cool place that looked all abandoned. But it wasn't until 1993 that I um, was speaking to, a, was at a friend's house. His father had been a fireman during Son of Sam period. He said he was in Berkowitz's apartment a few days before the arrest. It was totally clean. And then he said, and did you know that there was a cult in Untermeyer Park that helped Berkowitz do the Son of Sam killings? And I was hooked from that moment on. That was it. That was the moment. That, I mean, anyone who's still a fan of the ultimate evil, you know, you know what I'm talking about here, about how that book sucks you in, holds on to you, doesn't let you go. You become obsessed with snuff films and child trafficking and thinking that there's this international ring and that dog ears are being mounted in North Dakota from Yonkers dogs and all this kind of stuff. Well, it's been a long, strange journey, but uh, these are just more pictures of Untermeyer Park from the 90s that I took on film. I actually developed these myself uh, and all that kind of stuff. I was big into photography back in the day. So we go back a long, long way in Untermeyer Park. This is the eagle's nest before it had the protective fencing on it. You could just fall right over. And uh, looking out on the famous Hudson River, I mean, 20 some odd years later, almost 30 years later, I'm doing the same damn thing. I mean, <laughs> I don't know what that says about my life, but uh, that's neither here nor there. And so there's a picture my boy Mike Schiff took in Untermeyer Park in 1997. Uh, I believe Mike Schiff took this picture of the gardens in 97. And uh, I took this picture of Mike Schiff in 1997 at the Eagle's Nest as well. So Mike and I have a long, long history of Son of Sam lore, Untermeyer Park. And we've been there for a long time doing this. And him and I used to actually go out there some nights and try to stake out uh, satanic activity. Um, we'd go there on the nights that like, Maury Terry said that there was satanic uh, holidays and we would go like at late at night and see if we could stake it out. And of course, we never saw anything because we, we were doing this in the late in the late 90s. Oh, shit. Someone brought. <laughs> oh, man. X-ray punch the artificial group for life. Yo, for those who don't know uh, that it was my show on BronxNet. Wow. Isn't that something? And uh, that dude is an old school G-man head. Wow, that's 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 bringing up some memories. Thanks, X-Ray. Re appreciate that. And um, anyway, I forgot where I was going with that. But uh, anyway, so one of the things that I have collected is some Son of Sam uh, memorabilia. This these promo photos. Sorry, whoops, started the video by accident. These promo photos here were given to me by uh, Al Romano Jr., who was one of Maury Terry's researchers. <laughs> this is the guy who showed me where the cross on the tree was. And this is, of course, the, these are the original photographs. You can see they're still in the, uh, usually I crop these, but I left them in the plastic uh, sleeves on these scans so you can see. And he's rocking his members only jacket with his cigarette in hand, uh, Berkowitz's apartment right behind him, the car house over here. And, uh, <laughs> yo, I, you and me both, I don't know why it's coming out in this font. I changed it to spooky fonts. <laughs> so it's, it's like the chat's coming out weird. So anyway, so these are kind of interesting because they, um, well, they're his foot promos and they're from 1984. And that's important because I want to show you the difference between the devil's cave, which he has pictures of from 1979 but, and 1984. So, of course, investigative reporter Maury Terry on the trail of the Son of Sam cult. Behind him in the upper right is apartment building where David Berkowitz, a.k.a. Son of Sam, lived. The left is the aqueduct trail leading to Untermeyer Park, where signs of satanic cult is found. Now, it's pretty far to Untermeyer Park. It's a long mile walk, right? It's not, a, not an easy thing. But of course, um, here is uh, Maury rocking the members only, the Lee jeans, and so on and so forth. A lot of new names in the audience. Welcome, everybody new. Great to see you here. 
And uh, and so this, of course, is what Maury used to say that there was a satanic cult at Untermeyer Park that was absolutely connected to uh, Son of Sam and uh, which would lead to this this um, headline right here. Now, of course, this headline was written in 1979. These pictures were taken in 1984, and it's kind of an interesting discrepancy. I, I'm just showing you the back of these photographs, nothing special, but just for full, full historical disclosure, David Berkowitz, Son of Sam cults. And we'll look at more of this photo. This is the famous photo um, that shows, it says here, O-T-O, if you read it that way, although you could just say it's circles and crosses, uh, not that big a deal. Um so this is 1984, and of course, uh, there's there's two sets of graffiti in here, or one could think it's one set that was all done at the same time, but that's not the, that's not the case. If you look at this photo, so, I'm sorry, that's just the back of this photo, okay? But if you look at the photo here of the Herald Statesman, and that's October 24th, 1979, right? If you look at that front cover, okay? It's not as complex, the graffiti in there. It's actually very little graffiti. And, and this was 1979. We don't know when this was drawn. This could have been drawn in 1978. In fact, there's, there's anecdotal evidence that it was. Both Mike Lorenzo and Craig Fitzgerald said that all of this graffiti, or most, the vast majority of it, was done after the arrest of Berkowitz just to troll people coming up to Untermeyer Park. I can see the Yonkersonians doing that. Okay? So, um... Here's a picture from, here's just that close up of what we just saw. Now, what's interesting is that this is a picture from the ultimate evil, uh, the latest edition. Okay. And I just screenshotted this now. Uh, and I'm like, yo, it's different. It's, it, it doesn't look quite the same, right? Like, because, and, and here's another picture of the devil's cave from the ultimate evil. And these pictures were taken in 1979. And we can see that all of that white graffiti was not there, right? All of this white OTO stuff, the white and the... You see, Maury's using this because it's all Son of Sam symbols, right? To make you think that this was Son of Sam. But here's the original, okay? It doesn't have all of it. Now, I know what you're saying. That doesn't look anything like the original. So what you have to look at are the crosses and the pentagram. Now, what I noticed today, of course, looking at this is that if you look at this pentagram, the horns here are, are on the top and the and the crosses are inverted. This picture, which is this is how it's oriented in the ultimate evil. The star is on top and the crosses are not inverted. But all I did was turn the photograph upside down. And it's the same exact thing. OK, so this is the devil's cave bef before all of this extra graffiti was was written on it on top of it. Okay, proving the point that a lot of this graffiti was done post 1979, let alone 1977. But you can see this is the exact same pentagram as this one is. It has the same uh, orientation. And you, if you're, if anyone's really interested in this, I can send you this slide and, and you can analyze it for yourself. Now, of course, the question is why in the Ultimate Evil was the picture put in upside down? <laughs> I'm willing just to uh, chalk that up to uh, editor didn't know from up right upside down. I mean, it's very easy to make that um, to make that mistake. So there is the devil's cave, right? So there was definitely um, satanic activity going on in Untermeyer Park, right? Whether it was um, definitely were teenagers trolling people, writing graffiti. Definitely the Iron Maiden heads writing their woe be tied to 666 and all that all that, that other stuff. See, I'm not into this crap. I can't recite <laughs> I can't recite to you um you know satanic stuff because despite what my detractors say, I have no interest in any of this stuff. I think it's the stupidest shit on planet Earth. I think <laughs> people who are into the occult are like the biggest freaking dweebs out there, actually. Uh they're just simply not cool people. So anyway, I want to uh, uh, I want to get up the. Um... No, it wasn't in here. Sorry, sorry. Let me get the video. So we're all set and ready to go. Okay, there's the video right there. So all right. So basically, what I want to do to add to the historical record. So we've just seen all those uh, photographs of the Devil's Cave. 
We've established that there was satanic graffiti there. Um, now what we need to do is uh, look at the historical footage of the oral testimony from our video series. No one else in history got this except for us. We should be very proud of ourselves as a collective group that the power of our video series brought these people out to me in order to be interviewed. All of these people were found because they were fans of the show, um, except for Mr. E. He was found uh, uh, through other means. But um, in either case, that's the power was the power of our video series when it first started. And 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 to this day, we're the only people who have actual testimony of uh, on tape of the of the satanic activity. So let's let's just watch the video I prepared. It's like, I don't know, 10 minute video. And I'll stop it every now and then and comment on it again. Today's video is just to pose the question. What the hell was going on in Untermeyer Park? And also to pose the challenge to the to the Maury Terry fans out there. If you think that this what we're about to hear had anything to do with Son of Sam, prove it. No, it wasn't in here. It wasn't in here. Mm -mm. Oh, I it thought was that right here. No, it wasn't in there. It was right here, right in this area, right here. I remember coming in this way. And it was right here in the center. Whoa, let's go in there from the other way. Let's go That's right, where right it to was. let's go right to where it was. It was yeah, it wasn't in there. So it wasn't in that little no. room. It was here, in this in this one. So right in this region. Right in here. Right in this region, right here. And exactly what was it? It was right here. No, it was like a slab like the one like the bench we just saw, like that. Uh-huh. Oh, Something like that. Something like that, yes. Like that. Yep. And it was and over it here. Was right right there. And the dog was laying on its side. You know, like a dog would lay in the vet's office, like on the side. Yeah, yeah. But just from the neck up, nothing. Gone. Aye. Gone. And it, you said it had still been But the been blood warm. wasn't still pouring. No, there was no, like the blood was coagulated already. It was already, but it was not cold, maybe because the, the, it wasn't cold out. Uh huh. But it wasn't really cold yet, no. No, but it was right here. It was definitely right here. So it makes mm -hmm. you wonder, like, what time of day they were doing this. It must have been pretty late or early, like, maybe 5 in the morning. Because if I'm you thinking. saw it at what time, noon? That's what I'm thinking. I saw it. No, it wasn't noon. It was about 9.30 in the morning. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So it was relatively early. 9.30. So they must, have been, they must have mm -hmm. laid that dog down there around 7 a.m., 6 a.m. for it to still be somewhat warm. Now, just so we're all aware, this took place in 1976. In fact, two days before Carl DeNaro was shot. <clears throat> this was when uh, Byrne, who you're seeing here, who lived just south of Untermeyer Park, she, her, her backyard bordered the south property of Untermeyer Park. She, um, and you can see this video. So, I, you know, if you're interested in the story more, just go look at it. Um, but this took place in, in uh, October, roughly October 25th, 1976. I'm, I'm sorry, October 20th, 1976, a few days before Carl was shot. So, wow. But, but at the time, too, yeah, it was, it was kind of in our heads. Like, who did this? We just thought it was, thought it was crazy. We thought it was creepy. We, but definitely we didn't connect it to, to David Berkowitz. We didn't even know who that was. We right. didn't know who, who what anything was until the summer of 77 a right year until, later until afterwards yeah but were there people and but but the thing that is though i mean i know you were a little kid so you wouldn't have made all these connections and you probably weren't talking to your grandmother about it but you had mentioned no. that your grandmother in the 60s kind of knew something was going on and right well my aunt who who uh or your aunt right right my aunt who is my mom's sister who is that's my grandmother that maternal grandmother um she she told she told me i told her on the phone i called her because i wanted info <laughs> and um she told me that everybody knew she said everybody knew not to go near onto my park um wow. ever there was uh devil worship that's what they called it devil worship in the 60s in the 60s, 60s, they, were in the 60s devil worship. they were calling it devil worship so in the 1960s, uh, they were calling this devil worship. They were worshiping the devil in the 1960s. Um, you know, very interesting stuff here uh, to consider. So Byrne was saying that. Hold on, I just want to. Uh, I just want to uh, get get bigger here. <laughs> so Byrne was saying that um, 
her witness eyewitness was uh, that she saw the dead dog was in October of 1976. Her grandmother and her aunt were talking about devil worshiping in Untermeyer Park in the 1960s. I have the story of the woman who was molested by her father and another person in Untermeyer Park in 1951. They said they were druids. They said there were she said there was German shepherds there. They were worshiping the oak trees. So that's our earliest. And God knows it was probably happening before then. I mean, 1951, it's not like some magic switch was pulled and all of a sudden everybody just ends up in uh, Untermeyer Park worshiping Druids. This is probably something that had been going on for quite a while. But again, <clears throat> connected to Son of Sam. That's one of the things Maury never did. It's like, how did 1950 dude have anything to do with 1976? And David Berkowitz from Co-op City. How did the dude from 1989, 1990? We're going to see these testimonies pretty soon. How did that have anything to do with David Berkowitz? Uh, how did the dude that Mr. Esau that we're going to see in 1983 to 1986, 87? How, 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 Berkowitz was in Attica prison. How did that have anything to do with Berkowitz? I mean, come on. This is the, this is like... We're, one of the things Maury Terry did not give us was any nuance in the story. He he was met in Untermeyer Park by a 15-year-old kid. He had already gone through the way and the cosmic police with Perlman and Wheat Carr speaking in tongues in a diner while Rumpelstiltskin was having a picnic with Mahatma Gandhi and the pipe band. I mean, while Snow White and the Eight Dwarves were sitting there. Um then all of a sudden the process comes along right and then he and then some some kid shows him satanic graffiti in untermeyer park in 1979 and all of a sudden the process is tied with david berkowitz i mean this is this is the the thought process and what's sad is that there's still people to this day one of the reasons why i'm doing the show today is because again the brigade of people out there who know nothing about this case they may be great researchers in the process i mean whoop de freaking do i mean who cares I mean, <laughs> what does that have to do with son of sam but but they're trying to step to me and saying i don't know anything about son of sam because i'm dismissing the process link and connection um so you know it's just it's just so stupid out there it's just like ridiculous all right so let's hear our next uh oral testimony this is craig then when i'm like 10 years old i was in the skateboarding and me and my friends, who are all a bunch of hoodlums from Glenwood and Walburton area, African-American kids, uh, they, uh, me and them, we went to Untermeyer thinking we could skateboard in the pools and the fountains that didn't have water in them at the time. Mm -hmm. This is in the early 90s. This is like 90, 91. And uh, it was summer, midsummer. I had to be home by dark so you know it gets dark dusk around nine o'clock or whatever right. so Untermeyer is about a half hour skateboard ride or walk from Untermeyer to Pine Street okay so it took me I left at like 8 30 I left Untermeyer's mm -hmm. and I left all these guys there they were all older than me so they didn't have to be home at dark they were ranging from I was 10 and they were all ranging from the age of 12 to 14 right and uh I went home and they stayed. About 10.30, I get a buzz at the bell, like frantic. And I go to the door to see who it is. And it's my buddy Pierre and Johnny and Critter and these other guys. And they're all, oh, 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 we just ran in from Montevideo. And they're, I mean, I'm not trying to be funny. They were white as ghosts for some <laughs> African American kids. And, uh, <laughs> they, they, they were scared. I could tell, you know, I was 10 years old, but I could tell they were scared. And they go, we went down the steps all the way down to the bottom where the pillars are at the bottom of the thousand stairs. And we were creeping through the brush down to the gatehouse. And we saw a procession of the Ku Klux Klan marching north. It would be the direction that he told me now. I'm looking back. It would be north. Marching north on the aqueduct just in front of like where the lion and the unicorn are oh, where you know, it lets you into the gatehouse <laughs> into the estate and they're holding a puff and telling me that i'm like the ku klux klan and i'm like you saw that and they're like yeah man and i was like they had white robes and hoods and they're like yeah they had torches but with black robes and black hoods and i 
didn't doubt it was the Klan at the time. You know, I'm 10 years old. Right. I seen the Klan on daytime talk shows. They got green, they got red, they got white, they got black. So I didn't think anything of it. Like, I'm like, oh, yeah, the kids saw the Klan. Bang. Um, that was it. So that took place in about approximately 1991 because Craig said he was 10 years old. I haven't spoken to Craig in many, many a moon, but he, I believe he was born in 1980 or 1981. So we're talking about 1990 to 1991. A group of kids saw a hooded, robed, black robed uh, a procession uh, going north right by the gatehouse at Untermeyer Park, walking on the aqueduct trail. And they were scared out of their minds and they and they ran out of there to go tell their friend uh, Craig. So now we're spanning the 1950s, the 1960s with Burns' grandmother and aunt warning them to stay out of there because of the devil worshippers. We're spanning the 1970s with Burns' testimony. Okay. Now we're into the early 90s, 1990, 1991. So what we need to do now is we need to hit the 1980s, okay? And that's just what we've done for you. So the first person that we're going to bring uh, to your attention is uh, Tommy Welker. Now, unfortunately, Tommy's no longer a friend of mine. He became very irate when we started to realize that Maury Terry was a, lot, a colossal bullshit artist. And we <laughs> we actually had the integrity to change our mind about the cult theory and start realizing that uh there was no cult and it was just berkowitz and you know and all the things that have transpired since then but uh so tommy's no longer a friend but still it doesn't change the fact that he was an eyewitness to this activity and his story takes place in about 1987 or 88 or thereabouts okay so because tommy was a, a older than me and and i'm like older than craig so he, he his heyday was the late was the mid the early to uh, well, the, the the decade of the eighties. All right, let's uh, let's get this up. I remember we couldn't get in a certain way, so we we kind of put our cars in places they shouldn't have been, really. Like, and that's all I remember. I don't remember where that was, but I remember at one point people worried about their cars and let's get the hell out of here, and we just kept staying, and then we got down here. And we had a boombox, so we were cranking music, probably some Sabbath or Merciful Fate. Or... Now, when you were down here, this, tell, tell, tell the audience, though, what was the difference in the look of this place between now and then? Oh, it was all, like, overgrown. There was, like, vines all over this. Jason posted a picture when I was on, and, I, and it gave me a flashback to what sure. it looked like. Um, just, it was, it was like a ruins, you know? It didn't mm -hmm. look like this at all. Um, there was vines and stuff all overgrowth, mold and growing. And what about forest cover, like trees? Yeah, it was way more trees everywhere. Like, this was all pretty wooded. Mm -hmm. Let's go over here. So, so you guys are chilling over here, and it's just you guys. It's not like uh, other crews of teenagers hanging out. It's just no, you guys alone. It, it was just us. And you know what the funny thing is, is when we. When we started hearing noise, now that I'm looking at it, they were right. They were either in that that house. Uh huh. Well, well, that would make sense because this is one of their locations. Yeah. Or and and they would, but there was people around outside for sure because I remember looking down and seeing like a group of people standing there. So so just so we're aware, this is the gatehouse where uh, Craig's friends saw the hooded robes. This is the gate right here. Uh, if you look just to the left of the gatehouse, you can see a gate. Um, I'm not sure it's showing up on, on uh, my pointer is showing up on your screen, but there's a little gate there. That's where the, uh, Craig's friends said that they saw the, uh, uh, the gatehouse. So notice how it's all centered on the gatehouse. Byrne was inside the gatehouse, saw the dead dog. Uh, Craig's friends saw the black robed occultists walking on the aqueduct just outside the gatehouse. Let's carry on with Tommy's story. So like right there? Yeah, but... More, oh, more over. I guess it must have been right by the guard. I just maybe that open area right there. I don't uh -huh. know if it was open. Probably if they had a. I don't know if they were in the middle of of like. There was probably way more trees there and stuff. But maybe they just had a had a, a clearing that they gathered around. Yeah, because I remember. Uh, uh, I remember there was tons of trees here. This was like being in the middle of the woods at one yeah, point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, they really cleared this out. So let me ask you, what time of year was this? Do you remember? 
it was it was definitely warm out it, it was probably july maybe because because you know a, a lot of people they they're into dates like was this some sort of satanic holiday day but that might be no, a little bit be too weird detailed. If it was july 29th because i know that's one of their dates and that's where a lot of the, a lot of the shootings took place around there right around that. right so that would be wild if it was i wish i knew i wish i could remember and what time of day was it like oh it was like midnight or 11 o'clock but we were here probably for about an hour. So you saw obviously the fire because you couldn't. Yeah. And then the fire illuminated the general scene. Is that how you were able to see people? Yeah. And then I just remember I was leaning on the wall over there. And let's go over to the where you were. I and remember I was leaning. I can remember it as plain as anything because I was I was pretty nervous. I would have been too. I would have been scared shitless. Actually. I was like leaning right here. Uh huh. It was pitch black and you know people were all around and then one of my friends was and it was over there and somebody said turn the radio off so turn the radio off and we started hearing stuff and started hearing chanting and stuff like that so we looked over peeking over the edge and that's when we saw the fire we saw people standing around it and at least two of them were wearing hoods robes hooded robes and I don't know if at that point they knew we were here yet. They must have heard the music. So was, then, you, so wait, so you were, so then you went from here. Your friend said, "Look over," and then where'd you go? We we all went over to this over area to this area here. where we just were. Because I remember it was definitely down to the right. Right, and that's where you saw the fire. Yep. And then and then what happens? So then, we I think we started blasting the music at them to try and get their attention. Like that we, but we didn't we didn't get a good look at them yet. But then, as it as time went on, then they. They, they realized we were up here, so they, we could see them around the fire, and I saw them looking up at us. Then they started, like, howling at us and making weird noises Whoa. and stuff. And I saw, I saw, we saw people going to the left, and we saw people going to the right. And once they got out of the view of the fire, you couldn't see where they went. And we didn't know if there was a path up here or over there, but we got the idea that they were sending people around both sides. And right, we, to outflank you. Yeah, and... Which would actually show a little bit of a military knowledge in a way of battles and defense and offense. Yeah, and they just, I know, you know, they knew the park. Like oh, the back, of their the hand. back of their hand. And we didn't know where the hell we were. So it was like, all I remember was looking down and just realizing those are not kids. Like, they look like a couple of guys were like were probably around 30 and maybe a little younger. Uh huh. And then I don't know who the, I don't know what the hooded people didn't see their faces, but. They didn't. They weren't the ones who started coming at, coming at, coming up this way. But I just remember they disappeared, kind of out of sight underneath us, Holy. and we could hear the howling on the left and the right. Oh. So then it was like, all of a sudden, somebody was just like, "Run!" and <gasps> and we just took off, and we were uh, just tripping. Uh, and, and that's where you ended up tripping up this tripping whole thing. up these steps. So pretty intense story, right? 1987, 1988, he's hanging there with his friends. They start, they see the same, they said there's robed cultists. So far, we're getting a lot of very consistent stories here, which means that these people are most likely telling us the truth. Craig didn't know Tommy. Tommy didn't know Mr. E. Uh, uh, Byrne didn't know any of these people. They didn't know each other. And they're telling us very consistent stories. And um, so, again, we're putting on the historical record these oral testimonies of satanic activity, occultic activity in, Sa in, in Untermeyer Park. And, of course, we are asking the, uh, the Maury Terry fans to prove that this was the process. We've done half of the work. We've proven that there, Maury Terry didn't even do this. He just told you that there was a satanic cult in the park because some 15-year-old told him so. He never found these people and did videos and showing you these actual oral histories and testimonies and stories. It just didn't happen. So we've done half the work. We've, we've proven that this stuff is not just urban legend, but it's actually true. Now it's on the onus is on the Maury Terry fans. I'm putting out the challenge to the Maury Terry fans. Prove that that was Ken from Australia in there chasing Tommy. Prove that that was uh, Daniel Carlton Gajusek uh, walking up that hill. Okay. You seem so sure of yourself that it was the process because you do some research and read some newspaper articles about it. Um, uh, you know, I want to see actual firsthand actionable evidence that exists in the corporeal world that I can actually use to convict a, a conspirator and son of Sam in a court of law. All right. That's what I want to see. 
All right. So now we're going to listen to our last oral testimony. And this is perhaps the most powerful because it's this is the one the guy who saw the most. This is Mr. E. He's wearing a covid mask because he just didn't need the hassles of being identified out on the street. He still has a, a, a lot of uh, uh, emotion with regards to these stories and he just didn't need the hassle. But he's one of us. He's not a covidian. All right. Let's carry on. And remember, this guy was in the unsolved. So, so it sounds like the police were contacted. How many times do you think the police were contacted? Oh, I mean, I know a few other families in the neighborhood used to call and complain too, because a, a lot of times we would find these animals dumped off Odell Avenue. Okay. And I they guess must they must have put them in the car and just drove out there and then dumped them right. They on. would drive because you can't get through that way. Right. Um, that pump house down at the other end there, it blocks. Is, it blocks the path for a car to get through. So you have to come in and out of Odell Avenue. And Odell Avenue, for those who don't know, is up this way, not even, what, a quarter of a mile this way? Yeah, a quarter mile or better. You um, come to, a, and it's a main road. You, yeah, you... and they would basically come out to the end of the aqueduct. They would make a right on Odell Avenue. It'd start going up a hill, and then there was a big, there's a wall there, and there's like probably a 15 foot or so drop off. And they would just, I guess, pull over in the middle of the night and just empty the trunk right over the embankment, down the wall, and into the woods. And, Isn't that uh, brazen, though? Because there's a lot of places that they could have thrown the bodies here where they wouldn't have been found. It's almost as if they didn't give a shit about people finding these things. Yeah, I mean, we definitely found bodies all throughout the park, down this way here, uh -huh. over this way. So it wasn't like that was their certain only area. Right. But we definitely found them scattered through the park. But that area in particular, there was a lot of houses that that was a hundred less than a hundred yards away from all the houses on the back of Odell Avenue. Right. And I know a lot of the residents would call once they heard what happened, and uh, they would call the police and complain. And um, I know at night when we started seeing the headlights, and my parents were privy to knowing what was going on now when we told them what we saw, and I know that they called. I couldn't tell you how many times, every time headlights would go by and we knew it was something going on, my parents would call the police sometimes and they would say, hey, you know, we see the lights going on there again. And I mean, all it would have taken was them to block Odell Avenue off from the aqueduct and they would have been stuck here. I mean, they could have had all the cars and right. all the people stuck and nowhere to go. I never even thought about that, but you're right. So you, so you guys would hang out watching the where, just about where would you guys be? Um, once again, this was all heavily wooded and, and thick, and we would probably be somewhere right up in this area here. I mean, sometimes a little further up on the hill because you can get a better vantage point from up at the top looking into the windows of the house. Uh -huh. um, sometimes we would be right in the front where the gates were because, like I said, the gates used to be opened. And they were heavily, heavily uh, filled with like vines and weeds and brush. Right. And we could just hide right behind the gates and we would be 25 feet from here and oh we would see what's going on. And, and so what was the sounds that you were hearing coming out of here besides the sounds of the animals? Uh, we heard a lot of chanting. I mean, uh, I remember it was a lot of chanting. These people were dressed in robes. Do you um, remember what color robes? I want to say dark purple. Okay. Um, or dark maroon, um, but I can't be positive on that because we always used to see them at night. night so right. they did have some torches lit up in there for lighting, mm -hmm. um, but it was like a dark purple or a dark maroon from what I remember. And there would always be some chanting going on, like uh, <clears throat> a lot of one head guy, I guess, would say something, mumble something, and then they would respond almost like when you were in church and I when mean, you wow <laughs> and when you heard all of this occurring did the voices sound like teenagers like grown men what was the story there <clears throat> no these these were definitely not teenagers um these were older men i mean a couple of times when we came in and uh we saw them we actually witnessed one at one point one of the cars that pulled in and it was just about just getting dark so we still had a little light because it was summer so it was maybe nine at night and we actually witnessed a guy carrying uh i think it was a cardboard box full of these robes oh from the car God. into here and i guess they passed him out or whatever um but i mean it, that was an older guy i remember gray hair um like a guy probably in his 50s or, or older 
And uh, I mean, even uh, when we heard the voices and stuff, it, it sounded like these were older people. They weren't like your typical teenagers that were a little older like than Aussie us running fans. around the park doing stupid stuff. Right. It wasn't like no. Megadeth this this and seemed fans. like it was adults. I mean, number one, they were most of them were driving because there was a bunch of cars right. here, so they had to have driver's licenses. Do you remember what kind of cars they were? That I can't remember. Like um, if they were if they were luxury cars. Yeah, or cheap, I I can't remember to be honest. Um, I don't remember if they were like upper class cars or luxury or. Um, but this was definitely something that was that was set up, and this was something that was being done by like a mature audience of people, not a bunch of teenagers getting together on a Friday night and just going crazy. <laughs> right, right. And that, of course, is one of the most interesting things for me because. In this Son of Sam story, you have the people that you're talking about, right? These upper class, seemingly older older men and women. Maybe there were women. Did you ever hear, ever hear women's voices? No, that I never heard. <laughs> never so you... heard woman voice, never saw a woman. So that story is amazing because it's the, the closest eyewitness to these things this is a guy saying that they were grown men people in their 30s to, to 50s he saw the person tra uh, transferring out the uh the robes he he confirmed the wooded area aspect the thick vines the heavily wooded area I, I, all of these stories are converging and these people don't know each other this actually did occur in in the woods of untermeyer park in the uh in the 1980s into the 1990s uh definitely in the 1970s we got the anecdotes of the 1950s and the 1960s so we've just covered um uh, uh five decades 50s 60s 70s 80s and 90s and um Again, amazing oral testimony, the first in history of, of any occultic activity taking place in Untermeyer Park. Uh, those of you who are into this story, I mean, I don't see how it gets any better than this. But we have one more story from Mr. E. Let's check this out. And uh, I remember we were at the house and he came blasting through the front door and he was hysterical crying and his face was beat red and... Uh, it, it looked like he just got into a fight and got beat up pretty much from the condition he was in. And uh, after things settled down and all, he told us a story, which I did have to talk to my mother and confirm some details because I couldn't remember every detail of the story. Uh -huh. um, but going with what I remember and with what my mother remembered was uh, he said he was cutting through the park and it was probably about 8 o'clock, 8.30 on, in the summer. And it was still a little light, still light out, uh, just getting to, to dusk. And uh, he got grabbed by a few people and they forced him to witness a ritual. And from what my mother thinks she remembers is they wanted him to partake in it. Um, and he wouldn't do it and they wound up holding him down and they wound up killing a, a dog in front of him oh my god and uh it just really shook him up to the point where he spent a day or two in the hospital here with trauma um F psychological or physical trauma uh, psychological um the only physical was they actually held him so he had a few bruises on his arms when he was trying to get away and they were squeezing him and holding him um did they, but he's, did they sexually molest him no so that is the uh, oral testimonies. Of course, all of these videos are uh, they're full length. They're on our videos. They're on our site. You could just look for them. The Tommy well, the Tommy one isn't, but uh, that's quite all right. You got the best part of it anyway. And the Craig one isn't either. You got, but you got the best part of it anyway. But um, hold on one second. I just gotta block someone here. And uh, so yeah, so interesting stuff um this that was a messed up story like who were the people that grabbed mr e's brother right were they the same 50 year old men or, or were they younger and then of course that bespeaks to the issue of how many groups were there in untermeyer park worshiping the devil and doing animal sacrifices was it just one group or were there like the group of older men and then maybe a group of younger men were there teenagers who were doing it and who weren't affiliated with any of it? Was there any intermingling between the three? And then, of course, the big uh, question of the uh, the sixty thousand dollar question is: Was it um, was it 
was David Berkowitz involved with these people? And was John Carr involved with these people? Now, in Monster Mirror, the book that just came out, where Berkowitz says that he did it all alone, he was uh, he was uh, the, the lone son of Sam Shooter, that he lied through his teeth to Maury Terry because he felt intense pressure in those interviews in the 1990s. Um, he does go on to say that he worshipped the devil in Untermeyer Park with Daniel Colton Gajusek. I just absolutely don't believe that one iota. I think he's still playing people up the middle with that kind of stuff. I don't understand why he just doesn't go the full Monty. If he if he admitted that he lied to Maury, why is he still talking about Daniel Carton Gajusek, the spiritually sick Nobel Prize winner? Um in Untermeyer Park is Moloch, and that's like the third Moloch. I mean, first you had Donovan was Moloch, and sketched by Billy the Artist, and then this guy is supposedly Alfred Hunt Howell, uh, who I did a 12-part series on, who was definitely a, uh, connected to intelligence on the board of the Dodge Foundation, involved in all sorts of spiritual ex spiritually sick activity through the Dodge Foundation. Um, Nikolai Amon was in his house. Uh, I know the full story. We got it from his mother. Nikolai Amon's still alive. But uh, in either case, uh, that was supposed to be Moloch, too. And now it's, of course, Daniel Carlton Gajusek, the spiritually sick uh, Nobel Prize winner. And, of course, that's the guy who Mike Codella uh, talks about um, with his Tani Lentini story. And I tend to believe Mike Codella as far as that's concerned. So we have interesting sociological questions here filled with absolute nuance that Maury Terry never gave you. And of course, the question is, if we have this evidence of occultic activity, now we have it in one video, today's live stream, so you don't have to go to four different videos to find this stuff. It's all cataloged here now for posterity and for history. If we have this, um, these remarkably consistent stories all coming out around the, about the same time period, uh, describing the same things, then the question, of course, is who were these people? And uh, then, of course, if you can answer that, then you have to, then you can, then uh, get into the minutia details of were they affiliated with David Berkowitz and Son of Sam. So Maury Terry fans, you have a lot of work cut out for you. It's easy for me. I don't think Son of Sam had anything to do with uh, Untermeyer Park. In fact, I've proven it m multiple times on over a, over 100 shows. So so I'm comfortable in saying that there was just occultic activity happening in Untermeyer Park that was a sociological phenomenon of the 50s to the 90s uh, that involved people that had absolutely nothing to do with David Berkowitz. And it was probably multiple groups of people. And of course, we got none of that nuance from Maury Terry. But the onus is now on the Maury Terry fans and people who are uh, to this day insist that the process was in Untermeyer Park, um, worshiping Moloch with uh, David Berkowitz while Billy the Artist was was sketching Ken from Australia. And then over there you had Mahatma Gandhi having a picnic with the pipe band. I mean, um, the, the, the challenge to you, of course, is uh, two words. Prove it. All right, guys. Thanks a lot, everyone out there. Have a great Halloween. I'll see you guys this weekend for our new series, Disco Dave's Crimes Against the Carr Family. Take care, everybody.